Hi everyone. Welcome, welcome. I'm Jyoti. And I'm Yasmin. And we're your co-hosts for the evening. Together we run the Margins Fellowship here at the Asian American Writers Workshop. And we're here tonight to celebrate these four marvelous writers alongside their mentors. Yeah, let's give it up. Let's give it up, definitely. So before we get started, I just wanted to get, get a little show of hands. Who is here at the Asian American Writers Workshop for the first time? Raise your hand. Oh my gosh. Well, welcome. Let's give everyone a round of applause who, who's here for the first time. This is um, a really special place, and we're so happy to have you here. Um, thank you for coming. So AAWW is a national literary nonprofit dedicated to the belief that Asian American stories deserve to be told. We're an alternative literary art space working at the intersection of race, migration, and social justice. We publish an online magazine, run fellowships for emerging writers of color, and lead community arts programs in New York City public high schools and senior centers. And of course, we host events in our space like tonight's. And we've been doing all of this since 1991. Um, this has been a really big year of change here at the Asian American Writers Workshop. We're in the midst of a leadership transition, and as we embark on a new chapter for AAWW in 2020, we've been cleaning house, um, taking stock of our really rich 28-year-old long history, and getting organized and inspired to shape all that will come next. Um, so to help usher in this new chapter, we're actually hosting and putting on a big uh, holiday fundraiser next week um, that we're calling the Book Bash um, um, to close out the year. So we hope you can come back and join us. It's gonna be next Tuesday, December 10th, here in this space. You'll have a chance to uh, continue to sp support the work we do in creating a sanctuary space for the imagination. Um, and just, you know, today is also Giving Tuesday. I'm sure everyone has been getting lots of emails. So if you want to get a head start, you can definitely find um, a donation bowl out near the elevator and one in the back uh, where we're going to be um, uh, giving chat books for a $5 donation after the reading. Um, so a little bit about some other upcoming events we have. On Friday, we've got a really special open mic at Asia Society. It's a collaboration with them, and our featured uh, writer is going to be Stacey Ann Chin. Next Tuesday, we've got a variety show of Asian American comedy with the group Overstep. And the day after that, on December 13th, we'll have a uh, reading with Ether Zia and Shamia Safi on um, occupation and resistance in Kashmir. And if you want to keep up with all the events that we have, you can sign up for our newsletter, and we've got sign-up sheets over by the elevator. So today is our culminating event for the 2019 Margins Fellowship. The Margins Fellowship is an opportunity uh, for eight emerging Asian American poets, fiction writers, and creative nonfiction writers to receive guidance and support for their creative practice, to build community with writers here at the Asian American Writers Workshop, and to build a home for their work. In 2019, we supported four writers uh, through the Margins Fellowship. Each has been at work on a book-length book project. They each received a $5,000 grant, publication opportunities, uh, writing space here at our office, mentorship from writers and editors, and two of them have already attended their residency at the Malay Colony for the Arts, and two will be going in 2020. So um, also over the span of several months, our fellows um, have been meeting one-on-one -on -one with mentors that we've paired them with. Um, they've been in conversation about their book-length works, about the writer's life, and much more. And tonight, these mentors are here with us. We're so lucky to have them here with us to read alongside our fellows. We're really grateful for the time that all of our mentors have taken out of their busy lives um, and you know, helping to shape uh, and give advice on shaping a career, life, and community as a writer. Um, yeah. And we also want to give a special thank you to all the volunteers, interns, and staff working tonight. We've got Rob, Tiffany, Amy, and Ruth. And also a thank you to all the funders and donors who make this fellowship possible, including uh, the Jerome Foundation, Nathan Cummings, New York Community Trust, Serdna Foundation, and individual donors. 
And we also want to extend a thanks um, to the, the group of writers, editors, agents, former fellows who have been coming in to meet with our fellows periodically through the year. These are, we organize these evening sessions, dinners, workshops. Um, among those who've come to talk to our fellows are Marwa Halal, Tanais, Annalise Chen, Peter Blackstock, Kai Lucia Wu, Yin Yi, Abir Hawk, Annie Huang, Alia Habib, Jin Ah, Kathy Parkong, Joy De Jesus, Wendy Shu, Jen Hyde, Pik Xuan Feng, Sahar Muradi, and Ke Olande Barrett. And again, yeah, totally. A round of applause. It's, yeah, we really, really appreciate them. Um, and again, a huge thank you to our mentors, Ed Yong, Tina Chang, Zena Arafat, and Lisa Ko for all the time and commitment to, to being a mentor. It's really, really appreciated. So another round of applause. Thanks. And finally, the, I mean, we just, we're full of thanks today. We really are. <laughs> we're just so grateful for these four fellows, um, you know, for all that they've brought to the space and all that they've given to each other over the past year. Um, and we're just so proud of you. So we're excited to celebrate tonight. Um, and as Jyothi mentioned, we've got a chat book featuring all of the fellows' work that's available for a suggested donation of $5 in the back. It features their writing and an illustration um, by the artist Caitlin Chan. So we hope you'll pick one up and even get it signed after the reading. And when we wrap up here today, we're going to have cake. So please stay and celebrate with us afterwards. Um, so our format for tonight. Jyothi and I are going to be coming up and introducing each of the mentors. And then they'll be introducing the fellow um, after reading from their own work. And so we're going to get started. Our first mentor reading tonight is Ed Young, who worked with Sabrina over the course of the fellowship. Ed is a science journalist who reports for The Atlantic and is based in Washington, DC. His work has been featured in National Geographic, The New Yorker, and Scientific American, amongst others. He is the winner of the National Academy's Keck Science Communication Award. And his first book, I Contain Multitudes, was a New York Times bestseller and a clue on Jeopardy. Um, we've actually asked each of the mentors to include a piece of writing advice both for their fellow and for emerging writers and all of us here today. Um, Ed's is to park downhill, end the day in the middle of a piece, or maybe in the middle of a sentence. Go to sleep knowing what your next move will be. Never wake up to an empty screen. Never write a lead first thing in the morning. Please welcome Ed. Um, so I'm going slightly rogue in that I'm not reading anything, but um, I am uh, currently in the middle of writing my second book. Um, so I thought I would tell you all a story from one of my reporting adventures from that book. Um, so the book is about the ways in which other animals sense the world around us um, and how those ways of experiencing our shared reality can be very different to our own. Um, and uh, I'm very much enjoying writing it. I have not written this particular bit yet, so for better or for worse, this is completely new and you are the first people who will hear it. Um, okay. So, I'm in the University of Missouri. In a lab, there is a table in front of me and on that table is a potted plant. And on one of the leaves of that plant, there is a little red dot of shimmering light, as if someone is about to assassinate this plant. Um, the light comes from a device called a laser vibrometer, which measures very tiny vibrational movements, such as might happen on this leaf. And those movements might come from my hand touching the table. It might come from my voice moving through the air and vibrating the leaf. Or hopefully, as I and the scientists I'm with expect, they might come from the tiny little thing sitting on the leaf. It's only a couple of millimeters long. It's really hard to see with the naked eye. Under a microscope, however, it looks a bit like a seashell with dark chocolate and white swirls on it. It is a tree hopper, a type of insect. And it communicates through vibrations sent through plants. One tree hopper will sit on a plant stem and shake it. And those vibrations will, course, will um, course through the stem and be picked up by another tree hopper sitting elsewhere. These are not sound waves. They're not waves of 
pressure that move through the air, so we can't hear them. They move through the plant. Um, and so we're all listening out for what this little thing might produce. And three of us, me, the scientist I'm with, Rex Cocroft, and his student, are all weirdly leaning in to this tiny little speck, hoping to hear something from the speaker attached to this laser. And what we hear is more or less like this. It sounds a bit terrifying. It sounds like a cat purring, but a very loud, aggressive cat, maybe a bit like a tiger. It sounds utterly unlike what you might think an insect would sound like. It's not like a, like a cricket chirping or some simple repeated noise. It, it's intense. And in fact, tree hoppers in general make noises very much like this. Their songs sound almost like frogs ribbiting or monkeys hooting. Some of them sound really deeply melodic, like birds singing. If you played one next to songs of actual birds, it might be difficult to work out which is the insect and which the bird. Of course, these songs we cannot hear, as I said, because they go through the stems of plants. But you can hear them with of laser vibrometer, or much more simply, just the kind of piezo clip that a guitarist might use, just a little clip on mic. And you can go out um, and put this thing on a blade of grass, or a twig, or a leaf, and hear these weird songs that abound in the world around us and we have no access to. So Rex Cocroft does this all the time. When this little insect starts vibrating, he just turns to me and he beams and he goes, I told you so. But he'll go into parks, into forests, and even into his backyard, and he'll just sit there doing a kind of vibrational prospecting where he'll have just a little amplifier and this little tiny clip, and he'll just clip random bits of plant and hear these incredible songs, um, unlike anything that he hears elsewhere. And as he tells me this, I look at him and say, can we do this? Like, can we go, like right now? And he says, yes. So he drives me to, to about 10 minutes um, outside of his campus to just a random park. And as soon as we get out of the car, he walks up to the nearest tree and he turns over a leaf and there is a tree hopper, a bunch of eggs, a bug waiting to attack the tree hopper. There's this whole world of life that I would never know was there and that he is very deeply attuned to. We walk a little bit further and um, find just this edge of, uh, of meadow with tall grass around. It's the perfect place. And he and his students start clipping random bits of plants and listening to what we hear. Now, unfortunately, for the most part, we don't really hear very much because it is sadly a very windy day. And while insects do have ways of filtering out the noise of wind and only listening to the vibrations made from other insects, we have no such luck. So what the speaker is producing is mostly just a um, and this goes on for maybe half an hour. We try different spots, we try different plants, and nothing really is working. I hear the tiniest, faintest hint of a song, but it's probably from some distant stem to the one that we've just tried, and we can't localize it or make it more intense. And we're starting to give up. Rex is a bit disappointed because you really don't want to take the journalist on a show and tell expedition and have nothing to show him. Um, but it's fine, I'm telling him that I got a lot out of it still. I still get some sense of this, this hidden vibrational world. I can hear when a beetle lands on and takes off from a leaf. I can hear the footsteps of a caterpillar walking along a stem, but we don't hear the songs we're after. And so I thank him for his time, at which point his two students, who are a bit further up the path, say, we've got something, you should come and hear this. And we walk over to them, and one of them holds up the amplifier. And what we hear is this. It sounds like laughter. Kind of? Definitely maybe a creepy kind of laughter. It's definitely made by an insect but we cannot for the life of us work out where it is. They've just clipped some random um, blade of grass and there is no insect on it, at least not that we can see. We look around at the neighboring plants and we still can't see anything, but we can definitely keep on hearing it. That 
keeps on playing in cycles of six or seven again and again from the speaker. And I ask Rex whether he's ever heard anything like that before. And the songs of tree hoppers are very varied. There are some 3,000 species, all of which produce their own noises. And he says, I've maybe heard something a little bit like that, but nothing exactly like that. And that doesn't, that shouldn't surprise me or anyone else because very few people study these things. Most people don't even know they exist. Most people have never even heard of tree hoppers before. And yet there are some 3,000 of them. They're sitting on the plants all around us and they're making these songs that only they can hear. And of the millions of species of insects, many of them, maybe even most of them, use these kinds of vibrational communications. And so these songs abound in the world around us. Most of us would never get a chance to hear them, but those of us who try might well get to hear something that literally no other human has ever heard before, which makes me smile and maybe laugh. Thank you. Um, so the book will come out in two years' time. It's called <laughs> An Immense World. After a William Blake line, um, every bird that cuts the airy way is an immense world of delight closed to us by our senses five. Um, and it is my immense delight to introduce um, Sabrina Embler, Sabrina Embler um, who I've had the delightful honor um, of getting to know better over the last several months. Um, Sabrina is a staff writer at Atlas Obscura. She has also written for places like Scientific American, Wirecutter, Audubon, and Grist. I got to know her work for the first time roughly a year ago because of a column that she wrote for Catapult um, on that was a mix of memoir and marine biology. It was about the, uh, her life as reflected through the lives of amazing sea creatures. Um, one of it, they all had amazing titles like um, "How the Hairy-Chested Yeti Crab Taught Me to Survive Trump's America." Um, I loved these essays. Um, I loved uh, the way Sabrina writes. I think unlike. Most writers, she has this incredibly rare gift to capture all aspects of the natural world from its profound beauty to its often ridiculous absurdity. Um, and she writes with assuredness and um, with this wonderful command of style and structure. Um, and uh, I am delighted to say that she's also just sold her first book. Um, that's right. That's going to collect many of these um, marine slash memoir essays. Um, it will be published by Little Brown, um, maybe in a couple of years. <laughs> um, and uh, the current working title is um, How Far the Light Reaches. Um, and she is about to read an excerpt from one of the essays that will hopefully feature in this book. So please give the warmest of welcomes for Sabrina Imbler. Thank you, Ed. Um, I'm not British. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Big letdown. Um, I just wanted to thank the Asian American Writers Workshop, and oh my god, I'm so emotional. Um, I'm mostly emotional because this is like a happy emotion. I am a cancer. Um, when I was like in college, like thinking about like the possibility of like writing a book one day. The one person who I was like, I hope that I can write like him one day is Ed Yong. <laughs> um, and it's so special that I was able to be paired with him. Um, none of you have to cry. Um, and I didn't think that I would, but um, uh, it's been a week. Um, so this is an essay from my collection, How Far the Light Reaches. Um, it's about my grandma, and at the end there is a fish. Um, that's kind of my thing. And... Um, 
I guess for context, the essay is about how my grandma, who was born in Suzhou, China, and then lived in Shanghai, fled um, the Japanese army and the communist um, soldiers, and she fled to Chongqing along the Yangtze River. Um, and I tell her story alongside the story of the Chinese sturgeon, which is a very prehistoric looking fish that also lives in the Yangtze River. And so this is um, just a scene from a moment in her journey on the river. Um, it's a downer. <laughs> <laughs> to travel on the river through Hubei province, my family hired two small houseboats. The boats had no engines, powered only by the rowing of the crew, and so traveled the river at an achingly languid pace. They spent months on this river, the banks tressed with trees and water dismal yellow, a nightmare of a leisure cruise. Each night, the captains pulled the boats over to anchor in a shadow or under a grove. My grandmother slept in the belly of the boat alongside her family, stacked like sardines on shared quilts. Mr. Wong carried a map and guessed at which cities the Japanese may have taken. This is how they wound their way inland, eating as sparsely as they could. Whenever they spotted a village, the farmers rode to a bank to go into town and buy food, but these villages were scarce and hard to predict. So they ate one meal a day, always rice, cooked alone or in porridge or in soup that was more water than broth. Occasionally, the captain would return from the village with a feast of some vegetables or an egg, maybe two. My grandmother's mother always gave these things of substance to the grown boys or to my grandma's younger sister, never eating for herself. As they ate less, they rode slower. The boys rode and the girls cried and everyone starved. My grandmother sa sat above deck and stared into the pockets between trees for any kind of life. As time passed, she spotted ghost villages, footprints of the Japanese army. She saw pairs of broken windows boring out like eye sockets from a skull, vines digging into walls, listless sampans. Sometimes they passed Japanese troops stationed by the side of the river who would call their boat over and take the boys to do coolie work. Each time this happened, the women and girls waited on the boat, painfully aware that soldiers often do not return the boys they steal. Each time, thankfully, the boys returned. Gradually, almost like twilight, the river blushed pink. They began hearing the faint clatter of bombs from ahead. With all the farmers dead, the eggs ran out. But still the water sickened, dark tendrils and faint clouds of blood from the villages ahead seeping under the boat. The river was red, all red, and soon enough the bodies came, rarely intact but always recognizable. First an arm or a leg, later a torso, at one, f at one point unforgettably a head. They all wore the poor clothing of peasant farmers. The dead became routine, grisly apples bobbing downstream. They arrived in batches, indicating that the Japanese had just taken another village. My grandmother's cousins and Mr. Wong began to row, careful not to hit anyone with their oars. The red only deepened, small pink bubbles frothing each time the boat confronted a wave. The bombing deepened too, the cacophony of guns and cannons and airplanes swelling in the distant trees. My grandmother could not see these distant battles as a thick rim of trees shrouded anything beyond the riverbed, but she could hear them the howled commands of the Japanese soldiers, older ordering their men to push forward and go faster. Whenever the boat strayed close enough to hear the voice of a lone man, my family knew they were in danger. So the captains rowed the boat faster and attempted to stay out of sight in a hidden cove, aware that ammunition can cross the river like a bird. One day, the bombing stopped. My grandmother and her family could once again hear the river, its insistent gurgle, sometimes crackling into a roar. Three days after the rice vanished, the, the captain pulled the boat over and docked it at a bank. They had all grown too hungry to row with no village in sight. They had no rice, no flour, nothing that could make a meal. The kids had no energy to cry anymore. Everyone lay flopped on the deck, waiting to die. On the third day, my family saw a Japanese soldier approach their boat from a nearby bank. The captain hesitated but allowed the soldier to board. Straight-faced, the soldier strutted the length of the boat, asking in Japanese what my family was doing on this boat, what was the matter. My family did not speak Japanese, but hunger is easy to communicate with your hands. Mr. Wong said he was hungry with his hands, and the Japanese soldier gestured back 
with his bayonet. My great-grandmother pleaded for mercy with her hands, and the Japanese soldier listened and left. My family did not know whether to weep or rejoice, whether they had been spared a brutal death or whether the soldier planned on returning with reinforcements. Either way, they were dying. It seemed there were too many ways to die and too few to live. A few hours later, the soldier came back. He was carrying something heavy, a shadow on his back. Without asking, he boarded the boat and dropped on the deck a burlap sack as big as a torso. Without another word, he stepped back onto the bank and disappeared into the forest. The boat captain flipped open the top to show that the bag held rice, thousands and thousands of milky white grains spilling into each other like the froth of a breaking wave, almost out of place in the stagnant stretch of river. My family was so shocked they did not believe it or know what to do, but they understood that it meant that they did not have to die. Everyone cried except for those who were too weak for tears. My grandma wanted to run her fingers through the snowfall in the sack, but was afraid of dislodging even one precious grain in a supply that would have to last far longer than it was meant to. That night they ate watered down kanji, diluted like blood turned pink. While my mother lay starving on that boat, adrift in a winding river, ribbon of blood, young Chinese sturgeons lurked at the bottom of the river. They foraged for food in the scarlet murk of war, tasting, tasting the river's newly sour, irony tang. They did not know how lucky they were to have outlived most of their siblings, how easily they could have died. I wonder what they thought of all that red. One sturgeon lays anywhere from half a million to a million eggs at a time, but only 10% of the eggs escape the mouths of hungry river animals and the hazards of the Yangtze's current. Sturgeons lay their eggs in brisk waters to ensure their young spread out, but many of the eggs sink to the bottom of the river and suffocate under fallen dirt and silt. Those that remain stick to the river's mosaic bed of gravel. And of the 100,000 eggs that do survive, just a few sturgeon fry will grow into adults. Survival in the Yangtze is a game of chance with unrelenting, indiscriminate dangers that pay heed only to the elements. But still, some endure. When sturgeon eggs hatch, the small newborns look almost like commas, tails curving back and forth around their egg sacs. But still, they swim up to the surface in a wobbly, meandering gait. As the currents carry them up, their torn eggs stay behind, ripped edges reaching for the light. These shards of their embryonic home, once all they ever knew, begin to sink. Soon they will disintegrate, shredded by the current and pummeled into the riverbed until no trace of the sturgeon's labor remains. But in those fleeting seconds after hatching, these milky flurries of eggshell could almost be mistaken for grains of rice. Thank you. That was incredible. Let's give it up again to Ed and Sabrina. That was really, really special. Thank you. Our next reader is Tina Chang, who's been working with uh, our fellow UC as a mentor. Tina uh, is Brooklyn po Poet Laureate and is the author of Half Lit Houses of Gods and Strangers and most recently Hybrida, which was named a most anticipated book of 2019 by NPR, Lit Hub, The Millions, Oprah Magazine, Publishers Weekly, and was named a New York Times Book Review New and no Noteworthy Collection. She's also the co-editor of the W.W. W. Norton anthology, Language for a New Century, Contemporary Poetry from the Middle East, Asia, and Beyond. And she teaches at Sarah Lawrence College. I would be remiss not to mention that Tina was once a fellow here at the workshop. Um, in uh, the early 2000s, also alongside Lisa Ko, who's here to read too. So this is a really special night. Just feels like it's coming around full circle. Um, when we asked Tina to share some writing advice, um, she sent the following. Never stop writing, said my graduate writing professor as I stepped out the doors of Columbia University. I was petrified as I ventured into the world on my own with my poetry degree and he followed up his statement by saying, 80% of you will quit writing and 20% will continue on. Be the 20%.
Through the years, those words of advice returned to me in my darkest times as a writer. This piece of advice, which seemed so simple and so small, saved me time and time again. Please join me in welcoming Tina to the stage. Hi, how are you? Um, it's so nice to be here. I love this. Whatever this is, this Aerosmith mic is beautiful. Um, I feel so many emotions being here. Um, and I also feel so much bravery, you know, bravery to tell a story for the first time just off the top of your head, you know, the bravery to cry in front of people you know and strangers. There's, and I just thought, you know, when I walk into the Asian American Writers Workshop, I just feel so much nostalgia because it was over 25 years ago that I met Curtis Chen, who started the, the, the workshop, and he was a figure that, I don't know if you've ever had this kind of experience where you walk and you see someone, you immediately, in some strange way, fall in love with them, and uh, I felt like he could really see me and welcomed me in and really provided the space for me to be proud to be an Asian American writer. And so... It was in the year 2000 that Lisa Ko and I d just remembered that we uh, received this fellowship. It just was under a different name. It was under the name of the Van Leer Fellowship. And it does seem like it's coming completely full circle that now, um, t over 20 years later, I'm able to be uh, a mentor to UC. Uh, so I'm going to just read maybe like one and a half poems, if that's possible. And then uh, I'm going to introduce you, see. Um, I just recently came out with a book called Hybrida. And Hybrida uh, is the Latin word for hybrid, which is the combination of two or more unlike things. Um, my son is Chinese American, and he is also Caribbean American. And thinking about his existence in the world made me think about the sort of imagined fears that a mother has when they're raising a child, but also the very real fears they have of how are they going to be perceived in the world? Are they going to be protected? And so this is all written post um, Trayvon Martin, post Michael Brown. This is called Fury. My son rubs his skin and names it brown. His expression gleeful as I wipe a damp cloth over his face this morning. Last night, there were reports that panthers were charging through the streets. I watch from my seat in front of the television, a safe vista. I see a savanna. Sometimes, though, my son wakes to a kind of nightmare. He envisions words on the wall and cannot shake them. He tries to scratch them away or runs out of the room, but the words follow him. None of it makes any sense, but it's the ghost of his fear that I fear. What is a safe distance from the thoughts that pursue us, and what if the threat persists despite our howling. Buildings collapse. A woman falls down the stairs and lands on her back with only one eye open, half awake to her living damage. I think my son senses what's happening on the street, his heart fiercely tethered to mine. I know the world will find him and tell him the history of his skin. Harm will come searching for him and pour into him its scorching mercury, its nails, its bitter breath against his boyhood skin still smelling of milk and wonder. Somewhere, the panthers are running, starting fires fueled by a distinct hunger. Somewhere, there is a larger fire, a pyre stoked by the fury of all that we've come to understand, all we could have done but did not. Its flames lick the underside of the earth. It propagates needing only a frenzy of air to fan it to inferno. I'll call that the forest. The deep woods are ahead, and if the panthers could just reach it. If I told you that all of this happens at night, you wouldn't believe me. If I told you that all of this happens in the future, always the future, you would continue following the scent you could only describe as smoke. I'll call that justice. But aren't we talking about mercy and its dark twin? Isn't that what's pummeling the history on the side as I write this? Isn't it the thorn and the taser? Isn't it the chokehold and the gold arm of vengeance? I say it from my mouth. And when it spills forth, it lands on the ground in a pool of light reflecting back at me, the one 
true blasphemy, love and love and love and love and love is crowding the street and needs only air and it lives over there in the distance burning. I'll end with this, this is called Color. It's sort of a half a poem, Color. Up ahead, it's white. Snow animal, I'm running at your back. I fail to tell you I've been hungry all this time to tell you I've been searching for you like meat, like water. All my life, I've distanced myself as if to know you was to drown, as if to find you, I'd usher myself further from what is real. I've been adrift along the threads of time, leading me out beyond an imagined frame. I've untied myself, uncuffed the arms and neck. I didn't know I was hurt like that. I didn't know there was a force pulling me downward toward bedrock, lulling me to sleep. You are the one escaping. You are the one breaking free. I understand your astonishing dash to freedom, done with a strange wind, done with the frost and storm, orchids curling outward beyond grief. The road widens to glory. The road disappears. Thank you. So I, I've been so happy for the past half year to be working with UC Lynn. And we've worked together since the summer. And I've really been very astounded by just how graceful and full of ferocity you see is. I'm so fascinated by people who seem to house within themselves so many facets of the human experience. In UC's work, I've perceived strength and vulnerability, desire, and also restraint. And in fact, the body of UC's poems delves into theories of doubleness as a way to draw upon the complexities of duality the intricacies of mirror the interior and exterior, reality and fantasy, what is said, set against what sometimes cannot be fully uttered or expressed. I'll offer an example of such a moment in UC's work. If he had my courage, he'd choose to be born a daughter. What am I begging for? I have two mouths to speak. One remembers, neither forgives. Please help me give a very warm welcome to Margin's fellow, UC Lin. Hi, everyone. I've been so grateful to have received the Margin's Fellowship and to have had the chance to work with Tina. Um, when I was in undergrad, Tina skyped with our class when we read Of Gods and Strangers. And so it's very special to have my poet crush to be my poet mentor as well. <laughs> and also thank you to the Asian American Writers Workshop, Jyoti, Yasmin, thank you. Phantom. Mama, he haunts you that half-formed face by the door. At night he crawls, the cord around his waist drags the floor. He should have been 15 by now, you say. How fast grief grows, your hand moves toward a place already gone. I left nothing in there, took all the parts you would have given him, and now he chews. Forgive me, Mama. I was only playing dress up when I put his meat on my bones. When I hold your hand, I do it for both of us. When you say I am not enough, I cry twice as hard. I know he stands here, the way you look at him, through me, full of love. Only. Through your skin, they touched me and felt how I was becoming. Some viviparous fish eat their siblings in the womb. I did what was necessary. I wanted to live. In the dark water, a cliff of light, 
the one exit. Etymology. In Chinese, the word for good is a woman with child, and the word for woman is a hole wobbling on two legs, or maybe open the legs, and the child is a line leaning on another line, and there's no daughter, only woman, and man is strength lifting a field, or the field is crushing his back, doubled over his hands in the dirt, cursing the father, cross as all fathers, his ax lifted at the mother, proffering empty breasts. So when you kneel, is it always under God's stampede? And why do three women touching skin make the word wicked, but one female body populates a ravenous country and feeds it? They ask me what I want to be when I grow up, and I say good, but it's even enough to be just half of it. Before man, there was woman, and the woman said, "It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him." And out of the ground she formed every beast in the field and every fowl of the air. The man turned a stick in the fire and branded the sheep. He whipped a cow into the ground and named it Meat. Standing over the limp bodies, he said, "They were only equal to me." And the woman asked, "What would you have me make for you? Make me a god," he said, "if you love me. Make him in my image." Pathogenesis. My mother is kissing my father, is holding my lover, is shoving my mother, is choking my father, is beating my lover, is kissing my mother, is holding my father, is shoving my lover, is choking my mother, is beating my lover, is choking my father, is shoving my mother, is holding my lover, is kissing my father, is beating my mother, is choking my lover, is shoving my father, is holding my mother, is kissing. Wall. Don't let anyone see you cry, my father tells me. He shoves pain into our house and puts the hammer through. There's plaster in his hair, sweat stains at his pits. He kicks the new wall he's made. It holds. I stay on my side of the wall and imagine a life there, where I can love him. Baptism. Blue. It was all blue, a fire in the skull. The way something beautiful touches you and burns you from the inside. And as in dreams, knowledge surfaces from deep within the body. Something could hurt me without being here. Not really. Father's hand holding me down until I stopped struggling. Then he hooked an arm below mine and hoisted me. I wake, coughing up time, time pouring from my hair, my mouth, my skin, so that I'm eight years old again. And father says, "Swim." That's how it happened each time, and each time he saved me. Lie. Poem beginning with a line from Dene Smith. The bed where it happened is where I sleep. Firm queen, sixty by eighty, designed for two bodies, and the saying, "Now you must lie in it." The man I loved loved to tell lies, though he was honest when he punished me. For months, I let him. But I am lying. I say bed because it implies comfort. It happened on the couch, maybe, something cold, even in summer. What do I remember of the man I lay with? His right eye, the one I could see, 
burning like a cigarette. Still, I must lie for the scene to end. I wanted it, I tell myself, and it's true that I wanted to want it. The lie held me and the ones before me as I waited for pain to stop changing. The lie was necessary. I am ready to believe that I am a thing worth saving. The study of science. When love bent me to a man's chest, I stayed. Buried my face in the cave between his throat and ribcage, so we could react again. Like a pair of blue and yellow dots, I drew. An enzyme embracing its substrate. Praise the enzyme dragging its polypeptide chain, opening its arms over and over. Denatured not by time, but acidity or temperature. Most enzymes are specific, some promiscuous. A professor said in class that a chemical change is irreversible. We could have been bound for life. What a relief then, that when we leave the site of love, we are changed. I'll just read two more. Self-portrait as an allegory of poetry. In the beginning of my life, I floated, an astronaut drifting in space, and shame did not call my name, for I had no name. One cell, two crosses. One day, I made a toe, the next, a fist. One day I kicked and kicked. One day I swam myself free. My spine a stroke of white ink. Between my legs, a period. The Book of Changes. I sing into various forms, new bodies, for into suffering we live. You already know the story. A woman raped is punished with mutation, and therefore muted. God's destructions are intentional. No, I mean people. What made you also made me. The dull beat of one two one two on repeat, never moving beyond the first prime. Have you forgotten the little voice that multiplies your heartbeat, Vivam? Vivam, vivam. It feels good to be held by hands in the shape to receive. Go ahead, choose beauty. Let me imagine us dancing back our feet, our mouths pouring music. Let us make a book in which we shall have life. Thank you. That was tremendous. Thank you so much, Lucy and Tina. Let's give it another round of applause for both of them. That was beautiful. Thank you. Um, ooh, <laughs> I'm emotional. Um, that was incredible. I'm, we're going to take a short five-minute break um, to stretch. Um, you can go check out the chapbooks in the back, take a restroom break, um, take a look at our reading room and library. We'll be back in five minutes. We'll let you know. We'll give you a one-minute warning. Um, we'll come back and we will resume. So thank you all so much.
Hey everyone, this is just a one minute warning. We're gonna come back around in about a minute. Thanks.
All right, if everyone could just make their way back to their seats and get settled so we can move into the second part of tonight's program. Great. So our next mentor reading tonight is Zaina Arafat, who worked with Amanda over the course of the fellowship term. Zaina is a Palestinian American writer. Her stories and essays have appeared in publications including the New York Times, Granta, The Believer, VQR, Vice, and NPR. She has an MFA from the University of Iowa and is a recipient of the Arab Women's Fellowship at Jack Jones Literary Arts. Her debut novel, You Exist Too Much, will be published by Catapult in June 2020. Um, Zaina is also a former editor for The Margins, so we're just really thrilled to have her back in our space and working with Amanda for the fellowship. Um, Zaina's writing advice is about character. She writes, if plot is the bone you throw the dog while you rob, rob the house, then a writer robs the house by creating dynamic, multifaceted characters and allowing their decisions and trajectories to guide the narrative. Please welcome Zena. That sounds so didactic. I just heard somebody else say that, and I found it, <laughs> and I found it really useful. Um, so thank you so much for having me, and thank you um, to the Asian American Writers Workshop. I I live in Brooklyn, but um, for about a month, I've kind of had nowhere to live, which is an interesting situation to be in. And today, when I walked in here, I was like, or I've been sort of in between apartments, um, and today when I came in here. Oh, thank you. It felt, oh, all right, there you go. When I came in here, it felt like, um, it just felt like the home that I had been craving. <laughs> uh, so it's great to be back, and thank you all for being here. So I suppose I'll read, <laughs> I'm a little nervous, and okay. Uh, I, I think I'll read a few pages from uh, my novel that's coming out in June. In Bethlehem when I was 12, men in airy white gowns sat at a three-legged table outside the Church of the Nativity. They ran prayer beads through their fingers and sipped mint tea in gold-rimmed cups shaped like hourglasses, steam floating off the surface and up into the bright blue sky. I walked past them with my mother and my uncle as we wandered through the holy city. One of the men called out, Haram, forbidden. For the especially devout among us, it is haram to eat meat unless the animal has been killed in a specific way, haram to drink alcohol, haram for a pubescent girl to expose her legs in a biblical city. It occurred to me then that I wasn't a flat-chested kid anymore. I was no longer indistinguishable from a boy child. What should we do? I asked my mother. I felt a pulsing lump take shape in my throat as I noticed her teeth gritting, her jaw extended and temples shimmering. My great-grandparents' house was where we were staying and where all of my clothes were, 36 miles and three checkpoints away. I felt myself go cold. I had ruined everything. I closed my eyes and prepared to receive her reaction. I knew better than to try and preempt it with an apology. All I could do was strategically try and calm myself. I knew that the anticipation was heavier than the thing itself. Um, besides, I should have had better sense than to dress in such a way when we were visiting the birthplace of a prophet, albeit not our own. My mother had, and still has, a native's knowledge. She knows the rules instinctively in that part of the world, and I only ever learned them by accident. Um, sorry. But then, why did she let me leave the house that way? Was this all part of some plan to teach me a lesson? To my uncle, I was Ejnabi, a foreigner, which essentially gave me permission to dress however I pleased. But not to my mother. I'd grown used to maneuvering within the lanes of her behavior, looking to them as guidance, her innate instincts precluding me from finding my own. Basita, said my uncle, it's okay. My mother looked me up and down. We approached the main door of the church and the men hissed again. 
My uncle ran the tips of his fingers across his mustache, then looked to my mother and me. Come, he said, I have an idea. His master plan was that he would trade me his trousers for my Roxy surfer shorts. <laughs> we followed him into a gift shop, shop just off of Man Manger Square. He dropped a few shakels on the counter, then asked the shopkeeper if we could use his bathroom. My, br my mother grabbed a Kit Kat off the shelf and tore it open, breaking apart two sticks without a second thought. My uncle dropped three more shakels on the counter. The man pointed towards the back. Shukran, said my uncle, as he led the way. He went into the bathroom first, and I could hear sounds of fumbling, his belt buckle jangling as it hit the floor. He opened the door slightly and handed his pants to my mother so she could administer the swap. She then stood in front of me while I took off my shorts. Yalla, she said, her most frequently used word, hurry. I pulled on the pair of pants. They sagged on me. I had to tighten the belt buckle all the way up to the last hole and then roll the waist so that they wouldn't fall off, leaving me even more exposed than I had been before. I stepped out of the bathroom and looked at my uncle. I considered my new curves against his ridiculous pasty legs, gangly and covered in sporadic patches of hair, my shorts tight against his thighs like boxer briefs. It, occ it, it occurred to me in that moment to question why, as a man, his bare legs were somehow less troubling than mine. <laughs> it was a double standard, a shame I had simply accepted until then. I must have done something wrong. In acquiring my gender, I had become offensive. But as I stood in front of him, an unexpected pride began to swell inside me. I liked the way his trousers made me feel, seen, like I could get attention from boys, from girls. In Tiwalad or Labinet, are you a boy or a girl? A security guard at the Intercontinental Hotel in Amman had once asked my cousin Noor this question when deciding whether to lead her into the curtain-shrouded women's check for an intimate pat-down before she could enter the lobby. Binet, Noor had responded, girl. She'd been insulted by the question, the uncertainty it revealed. But not me, not that day. Wearing my uncle's baggy trousers, I enjoyed occupying blurred lines. Ambiguity was an unsettling and yet exhilarating space. As we walked back to the Church of the Nativity, I looked at my mother and smiled, desperate for her to smile back. But she withheld. She offered only a freshly disconcerting look, scrunching up her forehead so that lines appeared, her cheekbones protruding, her mouth forming a terrifying expression of indifference. At the time, I couldn't quite place the source of it. Had she noticed my contentment? Did it scare her? Only now, years later, do I think I understand. It was in that moment that she first realized I wasn't like her. The trousers were a demarcation line, one that separated me from my mother and her lineage. I wonder sometimes if that day was the start of something, whether it's when I began this habit of constant seeking, of endlessly striving to earn my way back. I communicated something to my mother that day as I stood there smiling in a pair of men's pants, a message I didn't know I was sending her. She has always known first what I haven't yet discovered, has always seen it before I could. Look at me, I wanted to say to her then. Please don't look away. Uh, so, in the time that I've known Amanda, I think that um, she's almost been as much of a mentor to me, uh, sorry, I'll stand up to the mic, as I have hopefully been to her. Um, I, I feel as though, yes, so, uh, I've been awed by the range of her writing, uh, the writing of hers that I've encountered. Um, she has the uh, span of being able to retell an Islamic myth in a contemporary setting to highlight modern day realities and problematic elements that happen in the Middle East um, and to sort of question that um, Western attitude and gaze. Um, and, and to go from that to <laughs> basically uh, a very deep but yet humorous uh, fragmented novella that explores climate change, um, war and famine, identity, and the everyday observations of a woman working in a veterinarian's office. And so, 
to be able to do all of that in one writer <laughs> to me seems very impressive. Um, and I just Amanda is um, has grown up between various U.S. states and countries in the Persian Gulf. She holds film. She holds degrees in film, religious studies, and creative writing. Uh, her work features hybridity, mongrelized forms of myths pulled from a transnational inventory, and issues of moral complicity as a modern American person. Uh, her work has appeared in the Colorado Review and at Paper Darts. And she currently works at Catapult as well, right? Yeah. So, okay, so here's Amanda. <laughs> First off, I just wanted to say thank you so much to um, the organization. Asian American Writers Workshop is such a wonderful, rewarding organization that's clearly done so much for so many people over such a long period of time. Um, thank you in particular to Jyothi and Yasmin for all the hard work they do. They're such generous people um, and so full of wisdom and advice, and I just have really enjoyed getting to know them and really appreciate everything they've done. Um, I want to thank my fellow fellows also. It's been so rewarding getting to know you guys. We've all had really busy years, but every time we got together, it was really helpful um, and invigorating. Um, and again, thank you to Zaina. Um, we've only just gotten started, but uh, it's already been hugely rewarding and just a brand new experience for me to be working with someone who has a somewhat similar background. And like what I'm finally able to talk about with her is something I haven't found anywhere else, which I think again goes back to what this organization offers writers, um, and is so impressive. So uh, really quickly, I'm just going to read a few excerpts from a novella project. It is fragmentary throughout. Some are one to two pages. Some are just a sentence. Uh, some sections are titled, and some are just numbered. But the only thing I think you really need to know for these sections is, as Zaina said, the, res the narrator works at a veterinary, as an overnight receptionist in a veterinary ER. Um, OK, so Persian cats. There's a woman at my gym who can't stop crying. She was in a car accident in 1992. Her whole face was smashed in. They rebuilt it, prettier than before. She always jokes with a nervous kind of sadness. But her tear ducts were damaged beyond repair, so she leaks. Like a Persian cat, I said, the first time I met her. She didn't know what I meant, so I explained, the snout of a modern, purebred Persian cat is pressed so deeply into its skull that the tear ducts are deformed. Owners, good owners anyway, must use a Q-tip at least once a day to dig into the folds between the bulging eyes and that ruined little mouth to soak up the moisture, or else the animals can get moldy there. Moldy, the old lady, the woman laughed. <laughs> at least I don't get moldy. I guess I shouldn't complain. Oh, no, I said, I didn't think you were, but you could. No, she said, I can't complain about any of it. I'm happy to be alive, you know, even this way. This is my life now. It's hard, but it's my new adventure. When she said that, I thought she must have brain damage. And then she said, you know, with the brain damage and all. And I apologized. I apologized for the thought I'd had and for the fact of it. No, she said again with rehearsed firmness. I'm happy, really, grateful to be alive. She cried as she spoke, of course, because she always does. But her eyes were slightly swollen, a sign I took to mean that the tears were meaningfully shed. I didn't know what to say, but my impulse was to tell her, no, you have every right to complain. You don't have to be grateful. Everyone should apologize to you. Everyone should try to make it up to you, make life easier for you. But instead, I nodded for a while more and then said, Please, I'm sorry, but please, I have to go now. It's getting late. I really have to be going. She did let me go then, but she catches me every time we meet in the locker room when I'm trying to dress or wash my face. She comes up to me and tells me more about herself. She always talks about the accident, but she has many more tragedies besides. And often she starts really, truly sobbing and leans into me, grabs my hands even when I try to keep them from her. I hold very still because my body doesn't speak that language and my tongue only knows the simplest phrases. Yes, yes, yes. I'm sorry. No, it's not a problem. I have nothing but this form of reflexive acceptance to offer her, and I know that's not good enough. That's not nearly what humans are meant to do for each other. 18. 
If you could have one superpower, the conversation goes. Well, it always comes down to two. Invisibility, like any number of mostly female heroes, or the ability to become incorporeal, like Kitty Pride. A hard choice to have both would be ideal. A friend points out that this is basically the power to stop existing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no mystery. I overhear a woman on the phone as I walk behind her. She says, a blanket went missing, same day as the dog. She says, he thinks I don't know what that means, but I do. 24. Miriam says, when she hears a liberal friend make a flippant joke about Bush, the invasion of Iraq, it feels like her teeth have just shifted in her mouth, but she smiles and widens her eyes appreciatively. When, at a party, a person he doesn't know begins to tell anecdotes about their recent birthright trip, Ziad feels his blood turn hot. It makes him sweat and his stomach gurgle with acid, fury, and grief, so he quietly excuses himself to find the restroom. A friend's father says over dinner that he hates Trump, but he just doesn't think the U.S. should be as weak as it was under Obama. If we say there's a red line, there's a red line. There shouldn't be anything stopping us from, you know, just taking them out. The them he refers to are a vague collection of cabinet members, elected officials, and religious leaders whose names he does not know and could not pronounce. I want to scratch his eyes out, or at the very least tear my own hair out in great bloody clumps and make him see, really see, how ridiculous and violent his stupid, stupid words are. But all I can do, politely, as a good guest, guest at his table, is put more food in my mouth and taste the fatty slick of overcooked pasta for several minutes while thinking the phrase, Sovereign nations, furiously. It is impossible, the way it cuts, how it feels, and you have no hope of explaining it or reacting to it, not if you want to live easily. Twenty-five. Maybe I should stop hoping to live easily. When you have the protection of citizenship or money or simply distance or all three, maybe it is fair that you lose some things. The kin who stayed suffer sanctions, war. Maybe you should have to, occasionally, miss out on a job or a date or a friend to defend them, even just verbally. Maybe that is what this is, being immigrant, being dual, being the lucky ones. And maybe it would feel good in the moment. Maybe it would feel like something useful, even if it isn't. 26. There is an old woman I like who comes into the ER often. She is part of an organization of retired firefighters who spend their free time going out to active fires in order to collect the pets, injured, dead, alive, whatever, so that the humans can focus on other matters. Leaning on the counter one night after dropping off a singed, sputtering kitten, the woman tells me that house cats are not clever when it comes to house fires. The animal instinct that once told them to run away was removed, and in its place an impulse was put telling them simply to hide, burrow down and stay, no matter how close the flames come. This is domestication, the house above all else. Thank you. Yeah, let's keep clapping, that was amazing. Thank you both. Our final, final mentor reading tonight is Lisa Ko, who's been working with Abigail savage Lou over the past few months. Lisa is the author of The Leavers, which was a 2017 National Book Award finalist for fiction and won the 2016 Be Penn Be Bellwether Prize for socially engaged fiction and was also a finalist for the 2018 Penn Hemingway Award, and the 2017 Barnes & Noble Discover, Discover Great New Writers Award. The Leavers was named a Best Book of the Year by NPR, Entertainment Weekly, BuzzFeed, The Los Angeles Times, Electric Literature, and others. Lisa's work has appeared in Best American Short Stories 2016 in the New York Times, and received support from the New York Foundation of the Arts, the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council, and the McDowell Colony. 
And like Tina, Lisa was also a fellow back in the day. Um, we're so excited to have you back in the space. When we asked uh, Lisa about writing advice, um, she shared something that David Mora, a former teacher of hers, said in, in an interview that stuck with her. In order to write the book you want to write, you have to become the person you need to be in order to write that book. Please join me in welcoming Lisa. Ooh. Hi, everybody. Um, it's so great to be here tonight. I'm really in awe of all your incredible words. Um, and it's such a dream to be back here and to be part of this program again, and especially to be able to meet and work with Abby. Um, the workshop is really my first literary home. It's the reason why um, I've continued to be a writer in so many ways. I not only was an intern here when I was in college, um, and not only did Tina Chang and I, um, we were mentees together during the same year, but sitting here, I just remembered that we were both editors of the former like literary newsletter of the workshop, kind of like the pre-margins. Um, it was print and it was called, get ready, Explanation. Uh, <laughs> it was the 90s. <laughs> Um, all right, so I'm gonna read. <laughs> I'm gonna read a few pages from chapter three of the Leavers. She promised she'd never leave him again on the day they found their doppelgangers. Back then, six-year-old Deming and his mother were still strangers to each other, but formed a satisfying pair. The same wide noses and curly smiles, big dark pupils underlined with slivers of white, a bit of lazy in their gaze. Her hand was foreign in his. He was used to his grandfather's warmer grip and more deliberate walk. His mother was too fast, too loud, like the American city he'd been dumped back into, and Deming missed a village, its muted gradients of grass and water, greens and blues, burgundies and grays. New York City was shiny, sharp, with riots of colors, and everywhere the indecipherable, indecipherable clatter of English. His eyes ached, his mouth filled with noise. The air was so cold it hurt to inhale, and the sky was crammed with buildings. He'd sought comfort in something familiar. He heard melodies in everything, and with them saw colors, his body gravitating to rhythm the way a plant arched up to the light. Crossing Bowery, he felt the soothing repetition of his feet hitting the sidewalk, his left hand connected to his mother's right, his two steps to her every one. She launched into the crosswalk. It was her one day off in two weeks. Deming examined the sidewalk dropping, cigarette butts and smeary napkins, and exposed between chunks of ice, so much gum. Who chewed these gray pink wads? He had never chewed gum before, and neither had his mother, to his knowledge, or any of her six roommates in their apartment on Rutgers Street. They stood before the subway map with its long, noodly lines. So what color should we do today, she asked. Demig studied the words he couldn't read, the places he'd yet to go, and pointed to purple. He'd been born here in Manhattan Chinatown, but his mother had sent him to live with his grandfather when he was a year old, in the village where she had grown up, and it was Yi Gung who had starred in Deming's earliest memories, who called him Little Fatty and taught him how to paddle a boat, collect a chicken egg, and gut a fish with the tip of a rusty knife. There are other children like him in Minjiang, American-born, cared for by grandparents, with parents they only knew from the telephone. I'll send for you, the voice would say, but why would he want to go live with the voice, leave what he knew for a person he didn't remember? Each morning, he awoke to Yi Gung sweeping the front of their house on Three Alley, Yi Gung's wheezing, silver smoke rings dissolving skyward, until the morning Yi Gung didn't wake up, and then Deming was on a plane next to an uncle he would never see again, and a woman was hugging him in a cold apartment full of bunk beds, her face only familiar because it resembled his. He wanted to go home, and she told him the bunk bed was home. He didn't want to listen, but she was all she had. That was two weeks ago. Now he sat in a classroom every day at a school on Henry Street, not understanding anything his teachers said, while his mother sewed shirts at a factory. They had traveled to Queens from one Chinese neighborhood to another, and when they emerged from the subway, the buildings were lower and the streets wider, but the crowds and the languages were similar, and despite the cold air, Deming could smell familiar aromas of vegetables and fish. It was a frigid, hard bite of a winter afternoon. 
Stopping at a corner, his mother introduced a new game. There could be a mama in Deming who live here too, another version of us. Like a best friend, but better, like a brother, a cleaved self. They chose the building this mama and Deming would live in, a short one with a flat front like theirs in Rutgers Street, and watch mothers and children walk along the sidewalk until they found a boy Deming's age and a mother his woman's height, a woman his mother's height. Her hair also cut so it settled in wisp against her chin. Can't we ask them to come over? We shouldn't disturb them, they're busy, but let's watch them, okay? She steered him into a bakery and he begged for an egg tart. Sometimes Yi Gung had let him guzzle Cokes for breakfast, but she never bought him anything. I want to meet them. He stomped his boot on the floor. Again, she said no. He tore down the sidewalk after them. Wait, he yelled. They turned around. They knew Fujinese. The other mama was older and skinnier, and the other Deming was eight or nine and not five or six, square-faced and squinty-eyed, like the kind of boy who might lug light bugs on fire for kicks. A fat crumb of pastry hung from his bottom lip. In the moment before his mother yanked him away, Deming met the other Deming's eyes, and the other Deming said in English, hi? Then they walked off, fading into a sea of winter coats. They're gone, Deming said. They left. Frightened, he longed for Yi Gung. Are you going to leave me again? Never. His mother took his hand and swung it up and down. I promise I'll never leave you. But one day she did. Thank you. <laughs> So it is my great pleasure to introduce Abby. I'm going to read her official bio first um, and then share a few of my own words. So Abigail Savage Liu is a writer and journalist born and raised in Brooklyn of Chinese and Jewish descent. In her fiction, she seeks to unearth the ravages of racialized capitalism, yeah. particularly through investigations of land use policy and displacement. No Ghost in Brownsville, her novel in progress, contemplates generation gaps within immigrant families, anti-blackness in Chinese communities, and the relationship of biracial identity to the myth of a post-racial America. Since graduating from Brown University with a BA in literary arts, Savage Liu has written long-form articles for publications including Yes Magazine, Color Lines, Jacobin, the Nature and Descent magazine. She's a former staff reporter for City Limits and a three-time winner of an Ippies Award from CUNY Center for Community and Ethnic Media. Um, so I only have a few minutes, but there is so much that I just love and deeply admire about Abby's work and her writing. Um, I love how she uses immersive storytelling and fiction to investigate themes like gentrification and colonization and displacement. Um, the attention and, and detail and care that she applies to her craft, whether it's um, character development and psychology to structure and research, um, and also the necessary interrogation that she really gives to, um, you know, what um, does it mean to be a novelist, the position of the author, um, especially with regards to things like race, class, gender, um, and ethics and power, which I think are just really important to think about, um, and what it means specifically for us as Asian American writers to tell the stories that we want to tell. Um, and I've really found that in the past few months that our conversations um, continue to just resonate with and inform my own creative process even after our meetings are done. Um, so I really can't wait to see her novel out in the world. Um, let's give it up for Abby. Wow, let's see. Lisa, that was incredibly kind and overwhelming. Um, I, when I read the levers, I was just crying by the like second chapter, and um, and just the way that Lisa engages with, as as Lisa was just saying, like the the sort of the role of the writer at, made me want to work with her so badly, and it's been just incredible because not only is she an amazing writer, but she's just incredibly generous with her time and sending me articles that relate to my work, and so I really appreciate Lisa, and also want to thank Jothi and Yasmin for this year, and to my three fellow fellows who've all read such inspiring, beautiful pieces tonight, so I'm trying to figure out the right height here. Um, okay, so I'm going to read from the novel uh, No Ghosts in Brownsville, novel in progress, and um, 
So it focuses on four generations of a Chinese American family in Brooklyn as the borough is transformed by modernist planning, uh, white flight, ghettoization, gentrification um, over the course of a century. So um, the excerpt I'm going to read is not the very beginning, but it's close. Um, and it's building on the story of Kai Ying, who is a Cantonese immigrant uh, who owns a restaurant in Brownsville, Brooklyn. And also his son, Richard, who migrates to America to join his father in 1935 when he is eight. So that's where the story picks up. Oh, and one thing is um, a vocabulary word. Uh, Bakwai is uh, Cantonese for white ghost and is used to refer to white people. Richard had seen her, but couldn't touch her, the real and beautiful America. Instead, he was shuffled from one prison cell to the next, from the crammed ship to the dungeons of Angel Island, from the roach-infested boarding house to the stuffy cabins of the transcontinental train. He arrived in Brooklyn, but the long-awaited big house turned out not to be a house at all, but rather the back room of a restaurant in a tenement on Brooklyn's edge, always baking in the heat from the kitchen. His father, Richard discovered, was not like an American at all. He would never talk or laugh loudly like the Bakwai on the deck. He was even quieter, thinner, and more fastidious than the men in the village. He never took a nap after lunch and sometimes did not stop for lunch at all. He and his hired cooks all lived with a single objective, to send money to their villages, to please their mothers and wives. Seeing all this, Richard came to a new conclusion. His father hadn't brought him overseas because his life would be happier in America but so that the envelope they sent back to the village would be fatter. Did your mother tell you? We are not like the others. We have a special title. His father's speeches always began like this. You are the only son, the first son, just as I was the first son, eldest of five, Dai Jai. And my father was also the first son, eldest of four, and his father was the first son, and his father, which means we inherit this family. Second son, third son, fourth son, he continued. They play. They are always children. They do not know how to lead. Dai Jai is always the leader. First son is the strong son. First son knows what he wants. You are young, so you can learn English. And then one day, you can have a good job, not in a restaurant, not like me. You'll wear a suit and tie and go to Manhattan. You can work at a bank. You can work at a company. But Richard did not want to wait for Manhattan. He wanted Brownsville, immediately. From the restaurant window, he looked down at the street and saw boys wrestling in the gutter, grandmothers crocheting in chairs on the stoops, sugar-toothed girls grouped around the ice man with his many glass bottles of colored syrup. He saw the dead quiet of Saturdays followed by the evening's eager rush to Pitkin Avenue, the laughing, the strutting, the stuffing of faces with pastrami sandwiches, the seagulls flying low for the scraps. In school, he learned from other boys about the tombstone yards and the railroad tracks and about the older kids who did naughty things at Tickle Me Park and also about the city beyond. Yes, he wanted Manhattan, but he wanted it now to climb to the top of a silver skyscraper to see a six-story tree decked in baubles the size of basketballs, to ride screech, start, screech in a checker cab until he'd reached every corner of that seething, chomping town. But every weekend, his father, but instead, every weekend, his father forced him in front of yet another Bert and Benjamin's beginner's English print book from the Chinatown stationery store, with page after page of dull gray cats and dogs and houses and bakwai girls and boys, and each with a wide line underneath. It's easy, it's a cat, he'd call to his father and run into the kitchen to point it out. But his father would insist he write the word. And it should have been easy, he thought, as it was for everybody else. But as hard as he tried, he could only stare up at the A, B, C strip that his father had pasted to the wall of the back room. It was like trying to order a series of live ants. He hated Bert and Benjamin's beginner's English print books almost as much as he hated the cheese sandwiches in the school cafeteria. 
It had been one year since his arrival when he returned home that Friday afternoon, longing to follow the other boys to Coney Island, tearing at the buttons of his shirt, kicking the crumpled newspapers and soda bottles that had gathered at the curb, filled with loathing for the, the little man who had enslaved him. He churned globs of spit in his mouth, fomenting three English words, masticated them with his tongue until they gained a thickness, until they were his, and he hurled them, loud and outraged across the street. I will go! He climbed the wood stairs, skipping the depressions in the steps, and pushed through the door into the dining room. It was so hot, he reached instinctually to pull his shirt over his head. On days like this, in the village, the children would spend all day splashing in the river. They would not be locked up behind layers and layers of brick, a human-sized furnace. Seething, Richard stomped toward the kitchen. It was crowded with cooks in dove-white tunics, chopping ginger and shaving carrots, the air steamy and scally and sweet. And he found his father bent over the metal safe, accounting for expenses in a notebook. Everyone is going to Coney Island tomorrow, he whined, pulling on his father's jacket. I need a coin to go to Coney Island. Closing the safe and removing his glasses, Kaying looked over at his son, at first saying nothing. Richard imagined grabbing the safe and crashing it through the window glass, pitching it onto the sidewalk below, the green bills flying like confetti, not knowing that in 30 years their lives would transform with the shattering of that window. All those years in China, your belly was full, said Kai Ying. Did you ever think why? I am never allowed to go anywhere, Richard cried, knocking a pair of forks off the counter. Bakwai boys go places in the summer. Why can't I? Bakwai boys go to Coney Island. Why can't I go to Coney Island? For a moment, Kai Ying said nothing and did not move, letting his son squirm in the silence. You think you are a Bakwai boy? He said softly and then with terrifying, escalating volume. Do you have money like a Bakwai boy? Can you talk like a Bakwai boy? Can you read like a Bakwai boy? Go to Coney Island when you can read like a Bakwai boy. Richard knocked his head against the dirty walls and groaned. He reached for lice, but felt his bald, blank forehead. He picked up strips of plaster along the sink edge. Take the garbage to the curb, ordered Kai Ying pointing to two black bags in the hall. Instead, Richard bolted past the bags and down the stairs onto the street. He could fend for himself. He could get money one way or the other. He had learned tricks from the boys. One way or the other, he would board the train to Coney Island the next morning. Thank you so much. Please give another round of applause to all our readers tonight, all of our fellows and our mentors. And that's it for us. We've still got a ton of chapbooks in the back, $5 donation. Um, you can also just take one for the road if you want one. And there's a lot of cake, so please stay and eat cake with us for a little bit. Thank you all for coming out.